Welcome to the May 2nd meeting of the Rotary Club of Jamestown. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, singing of our national anthem, and repeating of the four-way test. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red flare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home Let us repeat the four-way test of the things we say or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Our invocation today is by Paulette Klein. Good morning, everyone. Um, I decided this month that I'm going to look throughout history and find four um, individuals who represent the principles of Rotary, so to speak, community activists or people that made a big difference throughout the ages. And the first one I chose was Francesco di Pietro di Bernardone from Assisi, Italy in the 13th century. Some of you may know him. Um, he rejected all of his wealth, and in fact, um, his family then rejected him, but he went about rebuilding historical churches and community buildings in his town and became a beautiful activist for um, supporting the poor and building the community. And the prayer that is for today is one that he wrote, and it is the peace prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Thank you. Our Rotary Leaders recorder today is Sue Jones. As always, we thank that committee for all their work. And I skipped over John with our visiting Rotarians and guests, so let's go there. We welcome prospective men member Kristen Melville, and we welcome Pat Castiglia, who's going to talk to us about the chocolate. And Lori Brocklebanks online. Thank you, John. Uh, Ruth Lundin, Vision Committee, and other committee announcements, possibly. I 
I have all my props with me here. Um, so the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee will meet tomorrow at 2 o'clock, uh, either at CRCF or via Zoom. Anyone interested in attending, please let me know. The Vision Committee is going to meet next Monday, immediately following this meeting. So I will be getting an agenda and uh, a lot of information out. So I look forward to having good discussions uh, next Monday, uh, at, just after this meeting. May 21st, okay, first prop, on your tables, you will see uh, flyers for the hands-on Jamestown cleanup on May 21st. Uh, we at uh, Rotary has um, signed up to do cleanup along the river walk, starting at our statue. So if you don't know where our statue is, this is a good time for you to learn about the statue. And then going behind the JAMA, what used to be the JAMA building, and then behind what used to be Friendly's uh, down to the BPU. So that will be our territory. So we'll, we'll need lots of good help the 21st from 8 until noon. So there's an online registration. I have said we would, we would have a group, so I would appreciate people going online and saying you are with Rotary uh, Jamestown, uh, Rotary Club of Jamestown. Thank you. The, um, and sort of in keeping with that idea, we said, oh, it's spring again. We should have Rotary t-shirts. And here, this is, uh, I am delivering this to Becky Robbins <laughs> uh, after the meeting, but this is the t-shirt, what it looks like. It says Rotary in action, you know, so this is for like roadside cleanup and, and hands-on. And in the back, it says Rotarians at work. I think this is really important to get, help get the word out that, that we are a busy part of the community. So um, I, we're going to get to talk with Gary Peters this morning. He can get us uh, t-shirts for $12, men's size or women's size. I have a sign-up sheet and I'd like to get it. Um, if you're online, you can either email me. Well, I'll send out a club runner about it so I can get information back so we can get those ordered in time. He says the supply is spotty, so we need to get our orders in. Just a reminder, there's some flyers about this on your tables also about the Ch Chautauqua book read. And so that we're reading the book cast by Isabel Wilkerson. It's a community-wide effort. There are several um, discussion groups. Uh, and so you go on the YWCA side, site and you can sign up for one of those discussion groups. Anyone that has a place to hang a poster, I asked them to give me some posters so that Rotarians could hang them up either in your place of business or if you have you know, some public place that you could hang them up, please uh, take them. And I put on some of the tables, we have a little pamphlet about Rotary Club of Jamestown, and I think we should be distributing. So I, I'm starting going to put it on the sign in table from now on. But if you have anyone that you would you have a guest, they should have one of these. If you know someone you think might be interested in Rotary, they should have one of these. So um, please uh, take the ones off the table and ask me if you want more. Sorry, whole meeting is Ruth's announcements. Um, so uh, then I had uh, an email from uh, Kathy Moots, Mike and Kathy Moots. Temple School needs four kindergarten volunteers to help deliver junior achievement curriculum this spring. And I gather it's a, um, it's a pretty immediate need because uh, they, they asked us to announce it today. And anyone interested, I have the phone number and the email of Rebecca Johnson with uh, um, uh, with Junior Achievement, and it's a it's a really wonderful opportunity. And I hope some someone at least will will do that. But also see me uh, if you are interested. Thank you, Ruth. Diana. Just a quick update on our um, giving tree. 
I'm just calling it the Giving Tree Project that's taken the place of the parents as reading partners that we've participated in for quite a few years. So the update is a couple of weeks ago, I asked if anybody could help find seedlings for the Bush School, Bush Elementary, because they wanted to do a tree. You know, they're reading about a tree, an oak tree. And um, someone that was attending online said contact Chautauqua County Department of Soil and Water. And I happened to be sitting with Vince that day. So I said, okay, Vince, who do I, who, who's the, who do I call? And um, I had also been in, in touch with Doug and the environmental services thinking, you know, there might be a link up there. Um, Doug was vacationing and he kindly took my call, but Vince was the guy that was here and had the number name and number. So I called and so Rotary helped um, Bush Elementary um, get 150 seedlings that the older elementary students will be, be given. And they're also gonna get an instructional sheet um, that the teachers can use for their curriculum to teach the proper care, planting care and maintenance of their seedling. So I just wanna thank whoever that was, along with Doug and Vince for that information. I've turned it all over to the principal now, so she's got it and she's gonna run with it. Also, I wanted to mention that we will be participating in the Wish Tree um, as the parents as reading partners that we step in for. And that will be um, the last couple weeks of May and early June. But um, they're, they're a little more formalized than they have been in the past. So we're waiting for the um, schedule. And once we have the schedule, then we can send it out and you can sign up. So thank you very much. Just reminding everybody, May 16th, our evening meeting. I need registrations. If you're interested in coming, either let us know here at this meeting or just register online. It's a click of a button. There's no cost to you to actually attend the meeting from 4.30 to 6.30. Um, it's at the Celeron Hotel. We're, hopefully the weather will be nice. We can enjoy the indoors and outdoors, the view of the lake and have a good time meeting with everyone. So, um, but there'll be food available and there will be drinks available. So whatever you prefer, um, but you'll just pay for what you would like. So we'd love to have everybody there having an evening meeting just for those who can't make it normally during on these noon on Monday. So we hope to see you there. And then before, uh, I just have a happy buck when it comes up. I was just back from vacation, but when I was on vacation, my Kindle died. So I went by a little place and they had these little books that you could borrow. So I was very fortunate. So I really love our little literacy, the idea of being able to share a book, borrow a book. It was just like ours. And I'm like, I borrowed a book, finished it while I was on vacation and was able to return it. So thanks for doing that. Cause I think it's a nice little uh, thing that we have out there for everybody. Wish I could do this to the music. Who are you gonna call for highway cleanup? Rotary. It's this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. Park and ride. And if the weather isn't great, then of course we'll do it the following Saturday, but come on out. We'll be all ready with bags and pickup artists and all that stuff. So come out. Where are you meeting? At the park and ride. At what time? At 10 a.m. Thank you for the help. <laughs> the great thing about folks like Ruth and committee chairs who show up to meetings is I don't have to make all the announcements. And so the final announcement this morning is actually coming from one of our guests, Patricia uh, Castiglia. Uh, she is down here promoting the Gift of Life fundraiser from district. And so I'll bring Patricia up here to share a little bit more about what that is. You can do that. Can I use this? Okay. 
you know, I finally made it to Jamestown and I'm so happy. I, I've been here before, but not to one of your meetings, I have to tell you that. And I brought with me my wonderful cousin, Marlene, who has uh, volunteered to come with me on condition that you go to the wonderful Comedy Museum. <laughs> Lucy and Desi Inez. So we're gonna do that. I've been there, they're great. Um, so here I am. How many of you have heard of the gift of life before today or before I came? A few of you, oh, that's good. You know, I go to clubs a lot of times and actually in 1975, I'll give you a little bit of history on this, which you may have read about. Um, you know, there was a Rotarian from Hassett, Long Island, who happened to go to Africa, to Uganda, and he met a little girl there, she was five years old, who had a congenital heart defect. And he came back to his club, she was gonna die because, have any of you had a member of your family or some child you know born with congenital heart defect? Anybody here had that? Well, you're very, very fortunate because there are many children. I, I don't know the percentage today in the United States, but many children are born with congenital heart defects and we're so lucky. Aren't we lucky to be in a country where we have wonderful health care and these children can get the surgery they need and they can survive and lead productive lives? Well, this little child was in a country that that wouldn't happen. So this Rotarian came back to his club and said, could we help this little girl? Could we get some surgery for her? So her club, that club raised the money and they took, brought the child to the United States. She had her surgery. And as far as I know, she's still alive today. So that's how it all started. And then it's kind of spread on Long Island to other clubs. Other clubs said, well, gee, we'd like to do that. And finally, what happened was that in 1993, I believe it was, our assistant governor, some of you may remember him, John Rizik. Does anybody remember John Rizik as assistant governor? Okay, there you go. <laughs> We're in the same league. John um, decided he went to a Rotary Convention, another good thing to go to if you haven't been to a convention, went to the Rotary Convention, heard a speaker talk about this gift of life, and what they were trying to do. And he came back and asked the district, this is such a wonderful endeavor. Maybe our district should adopt it as a project. And it is the only real project that the district ever has. So around 2003, um, Gift of Life became incorporated and it's a 501c3 uh, organization. And our president right now is Rob Railman. His name is Railman. Do you know that 98.4% of all the money we raise goes directly to the children. We only have two paid employees, the director who's traveling all over the world to try and do this and an assistant and that's it. So you can see we're a skeleton organization. So where do we get our money? Obviously, I can't sell enough chocolate hearts to get $5,000 which we need for a child to have surgery. Well, how can we get surgery done for $5,000? What do you think it costs in this country? <laughs> try 400,000 or better to have the cardiac surgery. So how does that happen? Well, it happens because there are a lot of people like us who are community oriented, meaning the community in the world, who are interested in children who are born with these defects, who say to themselves, okay, I wanna volunteer. So these are all volunteer medical teams we have go. Doctors, pediatric cardiac surgeons, highly trained, highly qualified, doctors, nurses, intensive care nurses. We have nutritionists going. We have anesthesiologists going. So we have these teams that will go to the countries. Now, before this happened, before we went to the countries, guess what we were doing? We were bringing kids over here or to Canada for their surgery. So what did that mean for those families? Well, the families, this whole new culture, some of them didn't speak English. They'd be here sometimes for a month or so with these little children have to leave the rest of their families behind. And around, uh, I guess it was around 2003, it was decided that that really wasn't a very effective way. It wasn't sustainable. You could bring one child at a time, you know, to come over, but how could we make this better? The way we can make it better, we decided was to establish pediatric cardiac centers in countries where this could be done. You know, that's no little feat to be able to do that. Because first of all, they have to have a hospital. Some of these places don't have a hospital. Not only do they have to have a hospital, but they have to have, uh, that will support it, but they have to have government approval. 
Okay, that's another thing. Then the next thing they have to have is support from a non-governmental agency. And then the final thing to get these centers set up, they have to have a pediatric cardiac unit. You know how hard that is? I mean, it's really, really difficult to get all those pieces in place. But today we have three countries that have all of those pieces in place. We have El Salvador, we have Uganda, and we have, um, what's the third one? I'm trying to remember, Kosovo, I think it is. We have three countries that have them all in place. So we have centers there. And then we have a, a bunch of countries that we are in the process of developing those four things that they have to have. And that means we have to send teams over there to train those people. They don't just go once to that country. You can't train a pediatric cardiac surgeon just by going over one time or an intensive care nurse where they haven't had intensive care nursing. You can't train them at once. They have to go over several times to do this. Then when they finally meet the qualifications, then they are a center. What does that mean for the people in the countries? Well, not only that country, but the nearby countries, they don't have to come all the way across the Atlantic to us. you know. So it really makes a big difference in the lives of the, the patient and of the families that they can go to a center that is nearby with highly qualified people. So in the interim, while we're getting these countries ready, our teams go in, of course, and do the surgery. And we have to guess what? These kids are often undernourished. You've seen pictures of those little kids, haven't you, where their ribs are sticking out and they're malnourished. You have to build them up for that surgery too. So we need nutritionists to go in and work with them before they can have the surgery. Then we have to the surgery, do you abandon them? Of course not. You're not abandoned when you have surgery, are you? You can go to your doctor, you can go back to your clinic, you can go wherever you need to go for your post-op. And that's what we have to have for those kids too, especially with, with nutrition, because many of the countries, they just don't have that. So that's kind of what we're about. So what are the hearts about? Well, the hearts about us, about us Rotarians. We got involved in this in the beginning. And we always say, if you can buy a heart, you're gonna save a heart. And I tell people, if you're willing to invest in a heart, and they do cost $10, but they're great chocolates. They're from Platter's Chocolates. I have to tell you that they're solid chocolate. Um, if you buy a heart and you give it to someone, I always say to my family, you know, this is a good heart to eat, but while you're eating it, think that you're saving a child's life. And how many times in our lives do we have an opportunity to actually say, we have saved a child's life. For $5,000, we can save a child's life. Amazing, isn't it? Not a lot of money, but it's a lot of money when you're trying to sell chocolate hearts for it. But anyway, um, the other thing we try to do is ask some cubs if they would build into their budget an amount, $100 or whatever you can afford um, every year so to help support this. Here we are, 1975 to now is how many years? Almost, almost 50 years. And we're still struggling trying to raise money. Many clubs just don't know, even know about this project. And so I guess what I'm asking you today is, um, would you have a heart? Would you save a heart? Do you wanna have a chance to go home today and say, I help some child live today? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a small thing for us. I say it's a small thing for me. You know, some people say, well, you're going out to Jamestown so far. I said, not so far. When I think about what these other teams are doing to go out and save lives, you know, traveling around to clubs and begging for money isn't a very big thing to have to do because at the end of the day, I go home and I say, well, maybe some kid's gonna live today because this happened. Every single day, every single day in every one of these countries, we have a waiting list of 100 children who need surgery. 100 children. How many can we do in a visit? Well, let me tell you, in Kosovo, this past year, we did our 40,000th child. And when they go there, they go for a week or two, and we do, oh, maybe 20 in a week. And that's a lot. I mean, that's, of course, there are varying degrees of difficulty that the children have, so the surgeries are all different. But uh, imagine 40,000 children we've been able to do. And where else does a gift of life get money? They also get money. You know some of that money that you turn into the foundation all the time? Some of that goes into global grants, right? And you're all familiar with global grants. And gift of life 
always goes in every year with a global grant. Now to get a global grant, if you're not familiar with them, you have to have a new project every year. Not hard when you're doing this project because there's always another country, there's always another need, there's always something that has to be done for these kids. So that's my appeal today. I have some of those great chocolates back there. I have milk chocolate, dark chocolate, and orange chocolate. So between the three of them, maybe you'll find it in your heart today to support chocolates. And it's right before Mother's Day. Got a mother, a grandma, an aunt, a wife, somebody you think deserves chocolate, a sweet person. I got the sweet for them. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Yes, thank you, Patricia. <clears throat> You're getting ready, but I'm calling for the birthday table with Mrs. Sue Jones. Ten dollars. after a hiatus to Florida. And I just wanna say a couple of things. <clears throat> Come uh, July 1st, Greg and I will no longer be uh, leading the foundation and I won't be doing birthdays anymore. Don't know who is, but I do wanna tell you, <clears throat> our major goal has been for each of you to update your page on the website. We have not met our major goal. We have about seven weeks left. If you have not updated your page, please, please do it so that the new people that take over have some significant information to use in their challenge for foundation grants. <clears throat> Joni has volunteered to replace us, or Greg, as chairman. So um, if, by all means, if you have it in your heart to be a member of the foundation committee, join up. Uh, right away, we know that three members of our club must pass the um, course to be certified for us to write grants for our club to submit to the district and to Rotary International. So if you wanna get a part of that, um, look, look at it and see if you would be interested. Um, let's see, something else. <clears throat> Foundation giving, 66 members of our club are members of the Paul Harris Sustaining Club, which is wonderful. <clears throat> Paul Harris Sustaining Club members give 100, pledge to give $100 every year until they <clears throat> reach $1,000 and then they have earned their Paul Harris Fellow Award. Every year, every year or several times a year, the foundation committee draws names to receive the Paul Harris Award. If you have given $1,000 completed your, your challenge during the year, you will automatically get a Paul Harris. There's nothing more to it. If you have given $500, you get one ticket in the pot, in the drawing. If you've given 600, you get two, 700, three, et cetera. But <clears throat> it's a great way for you to easily attain a Paul Harris Award. If you leave the club, too bad. You don't get your money back. But know that your money has done great things while you were here. <clears throat> Otherwise, you have the opportunity to give to the foundation. And normally what we suggest is $1 for every year that you've been on our earth. So if you're 58, it's $58. And it's a nice way of doing it. 
I also like to remind everybody that probably during the year, you stop and get a McDonald's coffee mocha floca or uh, Tim Horton's ice cap or something. And just try once a week not to do that and put that money in a jar. And pretty soon you'll have $100 for the Paul Harris Fellow Award. So today we're going to celebrate the birthdays for May. And we're gonna do this fast because the only person here who has a birthday in May that I know of is Kevin. And he hasn't filled out his page, so I don't know anything about him. How's that? <laughs> the first one is Eric Harvey. You didn't want me to come back, did you? <laughs> um, the first person celebrating is Eric Harvey, and his birthday is May 9th. Eric is up here on the screen. I know he's with us someplace. He's a member of the um, communications committee and a new father. And I don't know whether it's a boy or a girl, but congratulations. He is a financial advisor with Alliance Advisory Group, a member of the Paul Harris Sustaining Club. And um, he has not indicated where he went to school. So your best guess. Let's say JCC today. That's my school of choice. How's that? Happy birthday, Eric. <clears throat> Max I. Miller. His birthday is May 11th, and he is the account executive for Sloan Mel Hewish. He went to Arizona State University. He has a bachelor's. Oh, sure. Nobody's listening at home. They're all afraid of me. all that but that's okay thank here. you thank you we're back to max max attended arizona state university and he has bachelor's degree in accountancy and a minor in business data analytics wow uh and he was sponsored by mike roberts welcome at, to max and happy birthday on the 11th <clears throat> megan barone her birthday is may 14th She's a uh, director of development at UPMC Chautauqua and the WCA Foundation. Kristen, maybe you can get her to come to a meeting with you. It would be wonderful. We haven't seen her in a couple of years. Uh, she attended the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Happy birthday to Megan on the 14th. Honorary member, Lillian Nay. Her birthday is the 14th of May. Everybody knows Lillian. She's a retired physician, city council member, and a retired president of the Gebby Foundation. She attended Wells College and the SUNY Buffalo School of Medicine and is one of the founders of JAMA. So happy, happy birthday to Lillian on May 14th. <clears throat> happy birthday to Colonel Horrigan on the 17th of May. He is retired, but he doesn't say what he retired from. Let's see, Colonel in the United States Air Force, the Red Cross uh, Executive Director, the Chautauqua County Executive for all of us, and many, many, many other organizations. And he is currently just retired, I think, from uh, United Way but he's still very active there. He attended Kent State University, Troy State University, and he was past president in 2002, 2003. And he has a Paul Harris Fellow in 2005 and 2008. Happy birthday on the 17th. 
Happy birthday to Tim Edborg on May 20th. He is a senior vice president in wealth management for the Great Lakes Consulting Group of US UBS Financial Services. He attended JCC. I knew somebody did. And SUNY Buffalo with a BS in chemistry and SUNY School of Dentistry. And he didn't like dentistry. So he went into music and plays the drums. He was past president in 2005, 2006, and he has Paul Harris Fellows in 2006, 2009, and 2021. Happy birthday, Tim, on May 20th. Happy birthday to Kevin Sixby. And this is gonna be really fast. His birthday is the 22nd of May. And question mark, question mark. Um, he attended Syracuse University and Baldwin Wallace College and JCC. And he was sponsored by Sharon Hamilton. He is currently our president and he has a Paul Harris fellow in 2016. And I'm sure the first thing he's going to do is fill in his page. <laughs> and happy birthday to Mary Schiller, whose birthday is the 23rd of May. She is an attorney, a partner at Fessenden, Lummer, and D'Angelo on Forest Avenue. She attended Duke University and the University of Buffalo School of Law. And she has a Paul Harris Fellow in 1996, but I don't know where she was then. So we need some more information, Mary Schiller, on your page. So happy birthday to her on the 23rd. And... <clears throat> We're gonna sing happy birthday to the Mayflowers, but our, the winner of our free lunch is Kevin Sixby because he's the only one here. There you go. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear flowers. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Tori. $31 to the winning ticket. Winning ticket number is 677. Kathy Birch. Now, before Doug pushes me off here, we'll reserve debate on what kind of flowers were thought to be. And Sue, I left it blank so I could do this. Personally, I would like to announce that I've made some changes in my career path. I am a broker affiliate partner with Alliance Advisory Group still, uh, but I've also merged my 6B insurance agency practice in with J. Edwards Insurance. Uh, so I'll be working under the banner of J. Edwards going forward. Dr. Conroe. Okay, thank you. We are running very, very late today, so we're going to give you all pretty much a break. Melissa, just remember to bring a buck next week, a little hint. So I will put in the pot. Dewey and Mark had to leave early. John missed. They really helped a lot. There's a lot of other things, but we're going to pass today and uh, beware next week. So for the first time, we have skipped happy bucks in my term. So I think we did pretty well. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring Tori Ergang up to introduce our program for the day. I really, really appreciate it. I apologize. I know we're going late. Today is the start of National Small Business Week. So I ask that you shop local this week. And I'm also honored that Dan at the Chamber and I hosted a press conference this morning out of the 20,000 clients that the Small Business Development Center worked with last year, two businesses in Chautauqua County were selected for state awards. Hector Alvario from Hotspot is our Minority Entrepreneur of the Year for the entire state. And Jackie Francis at the Asheville General Store is our Community Entrepreneur of the Year. So I'm really excited to announce that this week. Thank you. That was well worth it. Here I come. Yes, 
I'm going to be fast. Tamu, uh, well, uh, Tamu Reinhardt has a long and very um, interesting bio, but I'm going to skip most of it because the most interesting part is what Tamu is going to share with us today. But I will say that her official title is Coordinator of Student Support Services. And I think that's really important to us because one of many of her priorities have to do with identifying and addressing inequities that may be facing students. Um, and in particular, making sure that they have um, that culturally diverse students are acknowledged and that they have the opportunity to find relevant connections. And our club earlier this year or late last year, I lose track of time, helped to support a project um, that, make, that, that addressed one of those inequities that Tamu identified. She's here today to talk to us about Juneteenth. So about 15 minutes maybe? Yeah. Okay, I'll just talk. Yeah. Okay, I wanna go back to my first page if I could. Um, go back to my first page. Okay. Thank you for inviting me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come up, talk about Juneteenth. Um, again, my name is Tamu Reinhardt. And what I uh, was going to do, as every teacher should, was give you a quiz. But because we're late on time, it will be in your email. Um, at the end of the day. So uh, <laughs> be ready. So what I found was interesting even before I got up here was that we stood up and said the Pledge to Allegiance and we um, sang the Star Spangled Banner. And you know what a wonderful way to commemorate our freedom from the British in 1776. But sadly for some people, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, and so I'm gonna skip this here. Um, sadly for some people that wasn't the case. And so even though on 1776, we declare it Independence Day, we really, for African-Americans, we don't declare Independence Day until much later. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson today so that you understand really why it is such an important day to us and why we take so much time to celebrate it and why we were really, really pleased that um, the president decided to make it a federal holiday. So in 1854, Frederick Douglass gave a speech in Peoria, Illinois. And I, gave a I put a copy of his speech in your little packet there just to kind of get you to start thinking about the long road to freedom for African-Americans in this country. He read a, uh, read a speech, what to the slaves is the 4th of July. And remember, the 4th of July was not celebrated, well, was celebrated by the country and whites, but slaves really didn't, weren't really free. And so what his references referred, referred to in his, in his speech were the irony of how we celebrate our independence and yet there are people who are no longer free. So he gives references in the Declaration of Independence. He gives references in the Constitution and he even gives references in the Bible about how um, things have been, um, how African-Americans have been placed at a disadvantage with regard to American history. But at the end of his speech, he's still very optimistic and he still believes that there will be a day when African-Americans are free. Shortly after that, our, um, our uh, Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> um, Abraham Lincoln delivered a speech. And in his speech, he discussed how he thought sl slavery was a, mo um, a moral, um, he considered it immoral, he hated slavery. And a couple of quotes that I wanna say about him is, if slavery isn't wrong, nothing is wrong. If the Negro is a man, why then my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal. And there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. 
Even though he believed that slavery was wrong, he did not believe that the Constitution gave the president the right to free the slaves. He didn't believe that it had any power to establish sla or abolish slavery in the current states, but it did have power to abolish slavery in states that were going to join the union. So in 1860, that's the map, the blue states represent states that were uh, non-slave states and the red states that were slave states. Even though, I was gonna say, um, there were four border slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. And even during the Civil War, they remained on the Union side, but they were able to keep their slaves. So when Lincoln, when the Civil War started, it was really started through the lens of states' rights, not necessarily slavery at that time. Lincoln hated slavery so much though, that um, when one of his generals, John Fremont, put Missouri under martial law, declaring that the Confederate sympathizers would have their property seized and their enslaved people would be freed, Lincoln directed him to reverse that policy. So he's a little bit of a, an interesting character. But I wanna tell you um, kind of how it became more of a moral issue for him. He struggled with the idea and he knew there was gonna be little way for him to really uh, free the slaves uh, as president of the United States. He still believed that the constitution did not allow the president to do such. But he began to notice that the Confederates were using slaves to dig ditches, cooks, teamsters, hospital attendants, troops, and determined that because they were helping the Confederates, that they were given an unfair advantage or they were giving the Confederates an advantage. And he decided to use his commander in chief war powers to free the slaves. And he looked at it as a way to strategically help the Union and then they could actually end up winning. So he calls together his cabinet. So he calls together his cabinet and he tells them he's already made the decision to do this. And he said he would listen to you, listen to everyone and you can tell me about time and you can tell me about date, but I'm going to do this with or without you. And so William Seward, who was the secretary of state at the time, suggested that maybe he wait until we've had a decisive victory. Because if we did it now, it would look like an act of cowardice and retreat. If we free the slaves now, we look desperate. Let me see this slide is backwards. So this is the Battle of Antietam. And this is where they felt that there was a turning point in the Civil War around September 17th. And so as McClellan um, was able to not necessarily defeat, the Union considered it a win. It's a little bit of a debate among historians, but the Union considered it a win. And so on um, January 1st, 1865, um, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Exempt from the proclamation, however, were the states that already had slaves. So what that meant was Lincoln could only free the slaves in the states that were Confederate. He believed he could only free the slaves in the states that were Confederate. So the other states were able to keep their slaves. So he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. But remember, he's in Washington and Texas is way over on the other side of the country. And as slave owners were starting to maybe see a little bit of the writing on the wall, many of them moved and emigrated to Texas where there wasn't really a whole lot of fighting in Texas. So they weren't really worried about, um, they really didn't see Lincoln as legitimate and able to basically tell them what to do. And so two months, excuse me, two years after 
the ending of the Civil War. Union General, let's see here. Union General Granger, moving these people out of my way, um, wrote in the Galvin, Galveston Texas on 1865 with the general orders that read like this. That's actually his handwriting. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed they will not be able to, they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. By order of Major General Granger, June 19th, 1865. And so the slaves were free, or so we thought. Many slave owners did not tell their slaves that they were free and kept them working, at least some of them through the harvesting season before they let them know that they were actually free. Southern slaves, some of them hearing about the freedom, however, left Galveston and many of them went searching for families that had been sold off during their, uh, their time in slavery. Mothers, daughters, children, husbands, wives. And so it started as a yearly celebration the next year and it instantly became a success and every year, for about 75 to 100 years, African-Americans would pilgrimage back to Galveston, Texas to celebrate Juneteenth. And there's actually a group of uh, freemen who bought a 10 acre spot, maybe right around Galveston, Texas and named it Emancipation Park. Coming full circle, which I thought was interesting, is that in 1979, June 7th, 1979, Texas actually made Juneteenth a state holiday. And then in June 17th, 2020, we have our own state ho federal holiday. So how do we celebrate Juneteenth? It celebrated parade parades, street fairs and concerts. Juneteenth has a very strong connection with the church. Um, I don't have time to do a background on the church right now, but it has a very strong connection with the church. Because most of the slaves were from the South, you have to have barbecue. You eat red foods, like red velvet cake, or um, let me know the red food folks. Um, strawberries. Um, we, we actually say in our culture, when we drink Kool-Aid, do you want grape or red? That's what we call it. And you know, red could be any of the red flavors, it's grape or red. But they also read the Emancipation Proclamation. You may have already seen, always seen that Juneteenth has, you've seen maybe quite a few of these flags. So the official flag for Juneteenth is the one in the corner, the red, white, and blue. So it recognizes the colors of the US flag, but also, that showing that formerly enslaved people were Americans as well. This flag here, the one in the bottom, is the one first adopted by Marcus Garvey in the 20s. He was an abolitionist and he really believed that African Americans needed to um, go back to Africa. But he encouraged African Americans to adopt this flag, the red being the blood, the black being the color of the skin and the green meaning Africa. You will also see this flag that looks like the American flag. African-Americans have adopted that version of the flag as well. And this flag, uh, you may see flags that have some yellow in them. So you, sometimes you see yellow, sometimes you see red, black, and green, sometimes you see red, black, green, and yellow. Those colors also represent the Pan-Africa flag. And the diaspora of Africans who are all over, literally all over the world now. And so sometimes you'll see that flag. So yes, 
if you're white, you can come, um, come to the cookout. Um, we, we really realize and we need to recognize, I think it's important to recognize that um, African-American history is American history and that we are an amazing country and we should be able to celebrate in each other's cultural celebrations, but also understand that um, how we got here was not as rosy as what we may have read in high school. So I would suggest that you come down to our Juneteenth celebration on uh, June 16th through 16th, 17th, 16th, so the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, 17th, 17th through 19th, thank you. Um, we're going to have some activities. We're going to have a gospel fest. And we just would really appreciate seeing some people from Jamestown down there. And um, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Jackson Taylor Park. Mm -hmm. June 17th through 19th at Jackson Taylor Park. So Friday night, they'll just have a small um, little ceremony. They'll read the Emancipation Proclamation. And then on Saturday, most of the activities uh, display, we're going to also have some uh, information about Katherine Harris. And Silas Sherman, who part of the Underground Railroad actually came through Western New York or came through Jamestown. And then on Sundays, a gospel fest and some other activities. So um, off and on, because we had the COVID years, probably about 20 years. But we're a very small, not a lot of African Americans here. We're a very small group, but we like to have a good time. So um, we'd like to have you come down and join us. Yeah. Oh, barbecue and red velvet cake. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. We're much appreciated. Um, for the benefit of our folks on Zoom, for whatever reason, the uh, uh, the PowerPoint didn't display. Would it be possible that we take a copy and share it with that group? Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Tim, one of Rotary's major international programs is the eradication of polio in the world. We are down to just two countries in the world where polio exists. And in honor and thanks of your presentation to our club today, we will make a donation in your name that will vaccinate four children who will never experience polio in their life. Keeping with this year's, yeah. remembering this year's Rotary International theme, serve to change lives, caring for and serving others is the best way to live because it changes not only other people's lives, but also our own. Thank you, and we are adjourned.